Hi, good afternoon. This is Dr. Ina Iravon. And first of all, let me take this opportunity to thank the Organizing Committee of the Safety in Motherhood webinar for inviting me to speak about this lecture topic. So for this afternoon, my lecture topic will be on irregular menstruation, spanning from adolescence to reproductive age and perimenopause. So the objectives of this lecture are the following. So first we define what normal menses is, and then we go on to define irregular abnormal menses or what we call as abnormal uterine bleeding. And then we briefly discuss the causes or the etiology of abnormal menses or AUB. And then lastly, we also briefly discuss the management of abnormal uterine bleeding. So let's first talk about the normal menstrual cycle. So the precise sequence of events in the menstrual cycle occur in a cyclic process at about monthly intervals. And when I say monthly intervals, I mean that the menses are coming in at an average every 28 to 30 days. So when we talk about the menstrual cycle, we talk about the cyclical and synchronized anatomic and hormonal changes that happen in the ovaries and endometrium. In other words, there are simultaneous anatomic and hormonal changes that happen both in the ovaries and endometrium. Okay, of course, they get their signal from a higher center, from the higher brain center, which are the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So as you can see here, the menstrual cycle is divided basically into two phases, into two halves. So first, the first half will be the follicular phase, and the second half will be the luteal phase. So in between them, no, in between these two halves or two uh, phases will be ovulation. Okay, Ovulation, of course, is the release of the egg from the follicle. So in a patient or in a woman who's regularly cycling or regularly menstruating, we assume that the ovulation takes place at around day 14 to 15 of her cycle. Okay, So as you can see here, the follicular phase is predominated by the hormone estrogen. And where is the estrogen coming from? It's actually produced by the follicle in the ovary. And this follicle, once it attains a mature size, it ovulates. So ovulation, as I've already mentioned, uh, is a process where the follicle releases the egg into the fallopian tubes. And then the shell that is left behind will become the corpus luteum. And this corpus luteum eventually produces the hormone progesterone. That's why in the second half of the cycle, you see that the progesterone is the hormone that's already predominating. Okay. So in other words, the, simul the, the simultaneous uh, anatomic and hormonal changes that happen in the ovary and the endometrium are very important. No? Um, and you have to have an intact endometrium or a uh, functioning endometrium or a functioning ovary and a functioning hypothalamus and pituitary for you to have a normal menstrual cycle. So any aberrations or insult in the hypothalamus, pituitary level, or even the endometrium, uterus, and the ovary will possibly result in abnormal uterine bleeding. So first, what is normal menses? Okay. So in this uh, latest dissertation by uh, Professor Monroe, which was published in 2018, he defined normal menses as having the four components. First, the frequency. So the menses must come in every 28 to 38 days. So as I previously mentioned, usually the, the frequency of menses, uh, the menstrual interval is about uh, on average 28 to 30 days, but it can be as frequent as every 24 days or uh, every 38 days, so anywhere between 24 to 38 days. The duration must be at most eight days only. The reg for regularity, the shortest to longest cycle, variation must be less than or equal to seven days at most. And the flow volume, which is, of course, patient determined, should be normal. So what is irregular or abnormal menses or what we call as uh, abnormal uterine bleeding? Of course, Irregular abnormal menses will be the opposite of what I just mentioned. Okay, so you have irregular or abnormal menses if your menses are coming uh, frequently, no, more than or less than every 24 days or more than 38 days. The duration is lasting for more than eight days. 
if you have very light or very heavy menses. And the shortest, the longest variation is more than 8 to 10 days. Okay, so as I've already mentioned, no, this is what we call in general terms as abnormal uterine bleeding. And abnormal uterine bleeding as a general term can, can have vast definition. It can span from amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, meaning the patient may not have menses at all, or the patient may, be, may have menses but it's too little, or may be coming in very infrequently, or on the other end of the spectrum, the patient may have heavy menstrual bleeding or prolonged menstrual bleeding or very frequent menstrual bleeding. So abnormal uterine bleeding, ergo, will be menstrual bleeding that occurs outside the normal range. Okay, and this includes any of the following. Absence of menses or amenorrhea, menses at irregular intervals, menstrual periods that are more frequently than every 24 days or less frequently than every 38 days, excessive or very heavy menstrual flow, and occurrence of intermenstrual or breakthrough bleeding or bleeding in between menses. Sometimes, uh, this irregular menses can also be accompanied by abnormal symptoms such as this one. Huh? The patient may experience physical and emotional uh, changes such as mood swings, irritability, sleep problems, or uh, breast tenderness. Although most of the time, breast tenderness may be um, part of a normal period symptoms. Okay? Patient may experience spotting or bleeding as early as one to two weeks before the normal menses occur. Sometimes the pain can be so severe. No? There is accompanying uh, pelvic pain no? or there is a very, very heavy uh, bleeding that require um, medications. Okay? And because of this, this can disrupt their daily activities. So why are my menses irregular or abnormal? What are the causes of this uh, irregular or abnormal menses? Okay. The causes of abnormal or irregular menses may be uh, an aberration or an insult in any of the following levels. Could be the level of the hypothalamic or pituitary axis, okay, the level of the uterus or the endometrium, or the level of the ovaries. Okay, so as I've already mentioned a few slides back, for you to have a normal menstrual cycle, you have to have a fully functioning hypothalamus, pituitary and endometrium and ovary, okay? There should be uh, simultaneous or synchronized events no? that happen in all these three areas, anatomic areas. No? Any aberrations in those three levels can possibly cause uh, AUB. And the causes of AUB can span uh, uh, actually the full range of ages, no? from the adolescents, to the perimenopausal age. Now, for the purposes of our discussion, to simplify our discussion, I will divide the discussion into three age groups, the adolescents, the reproductive years, and the perimenopause. Okay, for the adolescents, the top causes of abnormal uterine bleeding among adolescents will be this one, this three. No? The most common, of course, will be an immature hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, which can lead to unovulatory bleeding. Okay? You know, these are patients who are very young. They usually are not ovulating yet. And remember, as I told you, no, um, a patient has to ovulate no, in order for progesterone to be produced and that progesterone will stabilize the endometrium. Now, without that progesterone to stabilize the endometrium and only estrogen as the predominating hormone, then that can cause um, non-cyclic uh, abnormal bleeding in these groups of patients. No? The second most common uh, cause of AUB among this age range will be the blood or coagulation disorder. And the third will be hormonal disorders, including PCOS. Now, um, so many gynecologists fall into a trap of just you know labeling these patients as having HBO uh, uh, immature HBO axis or anovulatory bleeding, but what I always tell them or remind other gynecologists would be to rule out you know, blood or coagulation disorders first you know, before uh, labeling them these patients as having just an immature HBO axis. 
as I've already mentioned, unavailatory bleeding due to immature HPO axis is the most common cause of AUB among this age group. Okay, and what is unovulatory bleeding? Uh, unovulatory bleeding refers to excessive non-cyclic menstrual blood flow that results from unovulatory production of sex steroids that is unrelated to structural lesions of the uterus or systemic disease. And again, no, the main cause of this will be an immature HPO axis. Now, it is expected, expected, of course, that during the first two years following Menarche, adolescent girls will really have an ovulatory cycles. They have immature, it's expected that they have immature HBO axis path. So here, the endometrium lacks the stabilizing effect of progesterone because they did not ovulate, no corpus luteum was produced, and therefore, progesterone, no progesterone was produced to stabilize the endometrium. So because of estrogen, no, the endometrium just becomes uh, continuously thickened and uh, it becomes so thick that it breaks down and sloughs off when, uh, when the estrogen is withdrawn or when it becomes very unstable. Now, adolescents with unavulatory bleeding appear to have delayed maturation of normal negative feedback cyclicity, and the rising levels of estrogen do not cause suppression of FSH. Now, in these girls with sustained acyclic estrogen secretion, the endometrium proliferates beyond the ability of the estrogen to maintain it, its integrity. So irregular heavy bleeding occurs when the endometrium becomes unstable and continues until estrogen-induced repair takes place. Now for the next uh, age group, we have the reproductive age. And most often, we uh, label this age group as uh, belonging in the 18 to 45 age range. And the most common etiology for this age group will be this one. No? That this is the palm coin classification of the causes of AUB. So palm is this part. This is the anatomic causes of AUB. And we have the coin part, this part here, which are the non-structural or non-anatomic causes. So as you can see here, POM stands for polyp, adenomyosis, lymioma, which are all benign structural lesions of the gynecological tract. And of course, malignancy or hyperplasia refers to cancerous growths, okay, which are, of course can cause abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay. For the coin part or the non-anatomic causes, we have coagulopathy. And under this, we have the blood dyscrasia, such as um, the, the um, lymphoma, leukemia, okay. thrombocytopenia, okay. ovulatory dysfunction, under which we have the most common will be polycystic ovary syndrome, okay. endometrial causes, iatrogenic, such as when the patient is um, taking pills or contraceptives such as DMPA. Now we move on to the perimenopausal age group. Okay, so perimenopause is actually a patient who's not yet in the menopausal stage, but it is, but she's already going into that stage. No, not not yet menopausal. She still has some um, uh, menstrual uh, menstrual periods, but um, when you see menopause, usually the patient is already. Um, amenorrheic for at least one year, no? but for perimenopause, she's still having her uh, bleeding cycles, but not as regular. And during the perimenopause, they usually suffer from these um, symptoms that are very similar, of course, in the patient with menopause. So they have hot flashes or night sweats, mood changes, vaginal dryness, sleep problems, and weight changes. But of course, the most common will be menstrual or period changes. And what are the causes or the most common causes of AUB or irregular menses during this perimenopause? First is, of course, anovulatory bleeding. As you probably might have noticed, no? anovulatory bleeding is also a cause of um, a common cause of AUB among the adolescent uh, age group. Okay? Anovulatory bleeding is usually a very, very common cause of um, AUB or irregular menses in the extremes of ages. Okay? So how... Uh, However, in the perimenopausal age, no, unovulatory bleeding is, of course, due to the lack of synchronization between the components of the HPO axis at, uh, that occurs as the woman approaches ovarian decline during uh, perimenopause or menopause. 
And the next will be malignancy, of course. Okay? The rule of thumb here, if a patient comes to us, no, a perimenopausal patient comes to us complaining of uh, irregular bleeding or AUB, we always have to rule out malignancy first. Okay, and there are so many kinds of malignant or types of malignancy under this category. Okay, it could be ovarian malignancy, endometrial cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer, vulvar cancer, or vaginal cancer. And of course, the third will be the benign tumors, no? such as myoma uteri and adenomyosis. Now we talk about the diagnostic approach for this uh, women complaining of irregular menses or AUB. Okay, of course, when I say diagnostic approach, I talk about doing a comprehensive history and physical exam and then confirming our suspicion using appropriate laboratory exams. Okay, first, for the medical history, we zoom in or focus on these two, the gynecologic and obstetric history and the medical history. So for the gynecologic and obstetric history, we uh, inquire about the menstrual or the bleeding pattern of the patient. So first we talk, we ask her what's her LMP, the last menstrual period, or how many days does her bleeding continue? How many days of full bleeding and how many days of light bleeding or spotting or brownish staining? No? And does bleeding occur between menstrual periods? If the bleeding is irregular, how many bleeding episodes have there been in the past six to 12 months? Okay, so what is the average time from the first day of, first day of uh, one bleeding episode to the next? No? Is this bleeding associated with dyspareunia or dyspineuria? Because the, those are clues that patient may be suffering from endometriosis or adenomyosis. Or is the patient even sure that the bleeding is coming from the vagina? Maybe it's coming from the rectum or the urethra. Okay. Okay, we also have to inquire about her sexual history, of course. So, so a, a sexual history helps to determine whether the patient might be pregnant, as pregnancy is, of course, a common cause of uterine bleeding. Okay, we have to rule out pregnancy first. And of course, a sexual history may also help determine the patient's risk for STD. Okay, STD can also cause uh, irregular uh, bleeding patterns. Okay. For contraceptive history, of course, as I've already mentioned, no? uh, intake of contraceptives like pills or even uh, DMPA no? that can also cause irregular uh, bleeding. And also inquire about her risk factors for endometrial cancer. Now for medical history, we ask our patients, maybe she's taking any medications that can possibly cause bleeding such as aspirin, or maybe she's injecting heparin. No? She may have a bleeding disorder or a family history of bleeding disorders and any endocrine, endocrine disorder that she may have been uh, previously diagnosed with in the past. Okay, let me share with you a, a very important or very useful screening tool that I use in my clinic, uh, especially if I'm uh, suspecting a patient to have uh, some form of a coagulopathy or blood or coagulation disorder. So this is a very simple screening instrument. No, you just have to ask the patient any of the following. No, does she have a history of postpartum hemorrhage? Did she have any surgical related bleeding, bleeding associated with dental work? Or is she manifesting two or more of the following symptoms? Does she have bruising about one to two times per month? Epistaxis one to two times per month? frequent gum bleeding, or a family history of bleeding symptoms. Now for the physical exam, we zoom in on these very important um, areas. So first, of course, is you have to check for signs of anemia because remember your patient is bleeding or has irregular bleeding. Okay, so first check the vital signs. Of course, tachycardia is a sign of anemia. Check the conjunctive and nail beds. Does she have pale palpebral conjunctiva or pale nail beds. Okay, check the general appearance. Does she have pallor? And murmurs also can be um, a sign of anemia. For the systemic findings, check the thyroid. Check uh, the optic foot dye and do visual field testing. For This may be a um, sign for a pituitary tumor. Of course, if your patient is adolescent, you may want to do a sexual maturity rating. Okay, check the breast also for signs of galactorrhea. And of course, palpate the abdomen because you might be able to palpate um, an ovarian mass. Okay, So for the internal exam, 
we have to do a speculative exam and internal, ex uh, internal exam to note the size and contour of the cervix and the uterus and adnexal masses or tenderness. Now for the laboratory examination, as I've already mentioned, it's very important that we have to rule out pregnancy first, no? especially in a patient of reproductive age. Okay? We also request for CBC, including differential and platelet count. Of course, blood typing, especially if the patient has already signs of anemia. Okay? This is just optional. You can measure iron stores. And of course, if we are highly considering uh, coagulation disorders, we request for PT, APTT, okay, for von Willebrand studies also. For endocrine panel, what's most important will be the thyroid simulating hormone. We can also test for chlamydia trachomatis or Neisseria gonorrhea, especially for patients that we highly suspect to have um, a sexual a sexually transmitted disease as a cause of the AUB. And of course, the most common uh, laboratory evaluation will be uh, the pelvic ultrasound. Now for patients with a history of amenorrhea or irregular bleeding prior to the onset of heavy bleeding, then you can uh, request for additional hormone panel. For now, for the last part of my lecture, we talk about the treatment. The goals of treatment are the following. Establish treatment based on a definitive diagnosis. Okay, so next is we have to correct anemia. We have to help the patient return to a pattern of normal menstrual cycles, prevent the recurrence, and prevent long-term consequences of an ovulation. For adolescents, of course, if you have already established a coagulation disorder, then of course we have to refer her to a pediatric hematologist. If after ruling out coagulation disorder, now the main direction of therapy or treatment is to temporize because once the HPO axis matures, then we expect that this problem of abnormal bleeding will be corrected, okay? So for the meantime, what we can offer this uh, patients will be the following. We can either give or offer cyclic progestins or cyclic progestogen to produce reliable and controlled menstrual cycles or what would be more uh, convenient for them would be to give them oral contraceptives. No? Just the uh, combined oral contraceptives uh, also is an option. Now for the reproductive age women, these are what you can do. So when the irregular bleeding is primarily caused by hypothalamic dysfunction or a PCOS, then we can give um, COCs, that's the combined oral contraceptives or cyclic progestogens. When the bleeding is due to anatomic causes, for example, adenomyosis or a submucous myoma, we can first offer the medical treatment. For example, GnRH agonists or progestins. Or if they're not anymore responding to this medical treatment, then we can also offer surgery. Now, when the bleeding is due to polyps or endometrial polyps, the gold standard of treatment, of course, will be to do hysteroscopic polypectomy. Okay? Or some gynecologists also opt to do dilatation and curettage. When the bleeding is due to malignancy, of course, no, we have to refer this to these patients to a set specialist, no, specifically a gynae onco specialist, who will be the one to administer uh, either chemotherapy, radiotherapy, or even do surgery if still amenable for surgery. When the bleeding is due to a blood disorder, of course, you have to refer to a hematologist. When the bleeding is due to a hormonal disorder, like for example, hyperprolactinemia or a thyroid disorder, then you have to correct that hormonal dis disorder, okay? Or when the bleeding is due to iatrogenic causes, such as for example, an oral contraceptive pill or a DMPA, you know, then we remove that causative agent or even replace them. For the perimenopausal uh, women, now if the irregular bleeding is due to an ovulatory cycles, then one option is to give them hormones, just low dose, no? low dose hormones, hormonal pills. Okay, so we can give the low dose or the 20 micrograms combined oral contraceptives or cyclic progestins. If irregular bleeding is due to malignancy, then of course we have to refer them to a gynae oncologist. If the irregular bleeding is due to benign tumors, then we can do hysterectomy. And this is a summary of a management, the management of acute bleeding. Of course, we can give them tranexamic acid, uh, pills, or progestins, or conjugated equine estrogen. 
do we have to hospitalize these patients? Well, we can, especially if there are indications for hospitalization. And what are these? If patient is already manifesting hemodynamic instability, if she's already severely anemic, okay, she has need for intravenous uh, estrogen and the need for surgical intervention, of course. Okay, that's it for my lecture. Okay, thank you so much for listening to my lecture and I hope you learned no, from this lecture. So in summary, these are the things that we have already discussed. We defined what normal menses is. Okay, we also defined irregular abnormal menses or what we call abnormal uterine bleeding. We also briefly discussed the causes or etiology of abnormal menses and the management of AUB. Thank you so much for your kind attention.